When our administration assumed office and reviewed the work already begun, we recognized the beginnings of a tremendous idea that could change the entire face of downtown Philadelphia. It was an idea that needed development, however. I suggested to the Planning Commission a four-point program, a most important point of which was the renewal of Washington Square East. This is the oldest part of Philadelphia, the place where our city began and where our nation was founded. If any place in the world was worthy of being rescued from decay, this was it. The Commission's preliminary plans were excellent, so good, in fact, that they indicated concerted action by every segment of our community. Philadelphia has been most fortunate in having many public-spirited citizens with vigor and vision in every walk of life who are ready to devote their time and energies to the improvement of their city. Shown an imaginative plan, but yet one capable of realization, they could readily see its potential impact upon the future of our city. Just one thing more was needed. A person of proven standing in the community, preferably a practical man of business, capable of translating the plans into reality. I therefore appointed as chairman of the City Planning Commission just such a man, Albert M. Greenfield. Renewal must begin in the heart of the city. On a large enough scale to give assurance that the character of Center City breeds life into the whole city. To get scope yet detail. To augment the fine commission staff. To look to the magnitude of the program yet find answers to specific problems. We of the Planning Commission engaged three nationally established architects, Messrs. Roy Larson, Oscar Stoneroff, and Vincent Kling, to draw a new and extended plan, enlarging the earlier projection of renewal of the historic old city. While the work on the planning phase was in progress, as Commission Chairman, I invited the participation of the leadership of our business our financial and our cultural resources to form the Old Philadelphia Development Corporation, a nonprofit organization of men dedicated to the rebirth and renewal of this great city. Their job, to speed the redevelopment process. To outline this extended plan, speaking for his colleagues and himself, is Oscar Stoneroff. Our assignment covered an area bordered by Broad Street, the Delaware River, Walnut Street, and South Street. And we divided this work among ourselves. Very early, we recognized the important relationship between Logan Square and Rittenhouse Square. with its surrounding residential neighborhood of the 18th and 19th century. And we felt a very strong connection between what we dubbed the Locust Street axis between the residential neighborhood of Rittenhouse Square and the future residential neighborhood of Washington Square. Early in the assignment, we realized the importance of relating to an activity that had already begun a scattered but significantly determined renewal effort by individual citizens. My particular contribution to this design was the integration of the old with the new along a very carefully drawn line of demolition. A small area close to Washington Square connected to a much larger one along the line of the river and Duck Street, seeking at this time a physical as well as a visual connection by way of a large opening under the proposed Delaware Expressway to a marina in the Delaware River. 
This was an early concept which developed into several variations later on. But one of the first steps in the realization of this redevelopment is now underway. The construction of Hopkinson House, a 36-story apartment building. Following the completion of this study, the Redevelopment Authority contracted to develop in more detail the plan for the eastern part of the old city area. To present the role of the Redevelopment Authority for us is its chairman, Michael von Moschisker. To the Redevelopment Authority falls the responsibility to plan in detail the new use of an area. To acquire the land, clear off the blighted structures and convey it to the redeveloper. The authority is also responsible for finding homes for the relocation of families displaced by urban renewal. Conservation, the selective clearance of neighborhoods that have begun to show signs of blight, is another vital part of our work. Equally important is the revitalization of whole areas and utilizing them to their fullest. In Philadelphia, we have the largest urban renewal project in the nation, Eastwick. Here, private enterprise, Reynolds Metals Company, is engaged in building an entire new community. Imaginative planning has separated the automobile from foot traffic in this new community of 60,000 persons. Residential streets are dead end to eliminate unnecessary auto traffic. Each street connects with a tree-lined pedestrian esplanade which residents use to walk to schools, churches, parks, and shopping centers. Pedestrian bridges span main intersections. Park-like areas border the walkway. It is a symbol of Philadelphia's determination to satisfy, within its borders, the cravings of its people and its industries for enough space and pleasant surroundings. Here, as in all other redevelopment projects, 1% of the cost of construction will be spent for works of art. Urban aesthetics have long influenced our plans for renewal. Following the Larson, Kling, Stonaroff study, the Redevelopment Authority engaged architect Preston Andrade to develop the plan for the eastern section of the old city. His assignment was not to enlarge, but rather to enrich the design structure. This scheme was used as the basis for a great competition that was held to select a developer. Four groups competed, and the developer chosen to complete the eastern half was Webb and Knapp. The man who created the winning design was architect Yo Ming Pei. As we study the Society Hill development, we found that the ground rules set by the Philadelphia Planning Commission and their consulting architects were really quite sound. As the areas of agreement began to define themselves, we concur in the decision to use towels instead of slabs. In this section of Philadelphia, we have a very unique silhouette, as determined by the slim towers of Independence Hall, St. Peter's Church, the Old Christ Church, and the Customs House. Our proposal defined the use of five towers, identical in design. The three towers in the easterly section will be set in a green and park-like setting. The north tower will be put on the axis of a historic building, the headhouse. The south tower is placed on axis with the new extension of Locust Street, which will be developed with the project. The third tower is arbitrarily placed on axis with the new group of residential square townhouses to the west. The other two towers 
near the already green Washington Square are in a paved setting of truly urban character. We find these five towers firmly in place, set by the inference of design structure impinging on the area from outside the site. In a project of this scope, the interaction of various groups is an important consideration. As certain problems evolved, we worked toward their solution with the old Philadelphia Development Corporation and its executive vice president, John P. Robin. There is a natural temptation in public bodies, in civic groups and business organizations to achieve immediate results, to be expedient. In this particular job, however, we felt then and feel most strongly today that quality, excellence, superiority of design is essential to true success. So throughout this job, we have tried to make sure that the paid towers would be actually accomplished on the site as presented to us. And during periods when it appeared that because of the admittedly higher costs of a superior design, this could not be achieved, we still stuck with the problem. And now, in our judgment, that problem has been licked. We find also that success in one project is the best guarantee of further success in projects still to come. The Department of Commerce, under the direction of Frederick R. Mann, proposed a recreation facility on the banks of the Delaware River in the downtown section and engaged the Ballinger firm of engineers and architect Robert L. Geddes to reestablish this area as a design element. In William Penn's original plan, the Delaware River was one of the great physical treasures of Philadelphia. Through the years, a series of finger-like piers replaced the pedestrian walkway. And in the familiar cycle, deterioration set in. As the result of a series of long-range public decisions, new cargo handling terminals have relocated the major port operation, and the original area can now be turned back to use as a public facility. Our problem was to propose to the city a framework for public action. The study was made a combined operation of an architect, engineer, economist team, and the result reflects a seamless process of decision. The first of the major public facilities gives a new visual edge to the city, a tree-lined promenade and a parking area along the riverbank. Connection to the city would occur at the foot of Market Street and also at the foot of Dock Street into Society Hill. The second public facility would be a boardwalk embarcadero, curving continuously for almost a mile along the edge of the Delaware River. With the provision of the promenade and the boardwalk, we felt that our cheapest land use would be open water and a series of water basins between certain piers that have remained in good structural condition. The piers that remain form the nucleus of clusters of activities to be developed by private builders and institutions. The most important of these will be a focus in the form of a tower marking the end of the major cross axis of the city, Market Street. To accomplish his role as an urban designer, the architect must participate as the engineering and economic decisions are being made. It is essential that the architect extend himself by making large-scale studies at the same time he prepares his small-scale sketches in order to understand the total setting of his design. In studying the whole of the center city plan, we made an interesting discovery. The spatial disposition of City Hall to Logan Circle to the Art Museum is virtually identical to the spatial disposition of City Hall to the Mall to the Port Tower. This may be merely an accident of history, but it does reflect on another basic responsibility of the architect. 
He must do in our time what is implied in past city planning, in past city building. The last of these design extensions was conceived as part of the 1947 plan and was developed in detail by Roy Larson. The interpretation of a plan, the carrying forward of its influence in the daily decisions of government is at least as important as the plan itself. This requires dedication by men of great sensibility and breadth. The City Planning Commission is fortunate in having just such a man as chief of its land planning division, Irving Wasserman. This final design extension is the balance to our continuity north of Market Street, which includes many historic buildings and interesting buildings in this area. A major focus is determined here at Christ Church, which dates back to 1727. George and Martha Washington, John Adams, Robert Morris, and Benjamin Franklin worshiped here. A greenway extends to the west, where an approach will be made to the oldest friend's meeting house in Philadelphia. Past Benjamin Franklin's grave, and a final return of this pedestrian movement to the great plaza of Independence Mall. As we look forward to the future, we do so with confidence because of the work that has been done, because of the support it has received, and because of the leadership given to the City Planning Commission by its present chairman, G. Holmes Perkins, Dean of the School of Fine Arts of the University of Pennsylvania. The Home Rule Charter of 1952 placed on the City Planning Commission many diverse responsibilities. The most important of these is the preparation of a comprehensive plan. This has now been accomplished. This plan is far more than a hope for the future, for it has placed upon it an accurate price tag which permits its total completion within our own lifetime. A second major responsibility is the annual preparation of a six-year capital program, which feeds projects into the process of government. This allows them to be built and financed on a flexible schedule. The Commission's interest, however, goes far beyond a purely functional and efficient arrangement of land use and buildings. We are equally concerned with the creation of an urbane quality of environment, preserving a human scale with space, variety, and beauty. We have worked towards these goals with many citizen groups and agencies who have vigorously supported the comprehensive plan. A noteworthy example of this vital cooperation is the Citizens' Council on City Planning. To explain the function of this organization, let us hear from its executive director, Mr. Aaron Levine. We make every effort in Philadelphia to have the citizens participate in the actual planning and building of their city stressing that human values must be preserved in large-scale operations. During the past seven years, citizens have worked very closely with the City Planning Commission on the capital program which is reviewed every year by citizen committees. To help the people of Philadelphia visualize the shape of the community in which they can live, work, and play, we have a permanent city planning exhibition the Philadelphia Panorama. This exhibit is administered by the Board of Trade and Conventions. To detail the purpose of this project, here is the chairman, Lawrence M.C. Smith. Ever since 1955, the Philadelphia Panorama has been housed in the Trade and Convention Center, to which over a million and a quarter people come each year. This serves the city in three ways. First, it presents the image of Philadelphia to the great number of foreign visitors who come to see Philadelphia. Second, it tends to break down the jealousies and obstructions between the various surrounding counties and to create a feeling of interdependence in planning. And third, there are 30,000 school children from the parochial and public schools who come to this area for their social studies. 
they engage in actual planning tasks on a community level, and it serves to get them ready to accept the plans of the future and to accept planning in their lives. The citizens who have had the opportunity to see this exhibit go back with new vigor and interest in developing a newer and better city. An interest that can grow to maturity only under a progressive city government. And we have this vision and leadership in our city council and in its former president, now mayor, the Honorable James H.J. Tate. We are today embarked upon a genuine program for a more beautiful and modern big city, which will at the same time produce the means to support it. This program is planned on a continual basis to increase our facilities, our level of employment, our payrolls, and our products and services. Every project in our urban renewal program must necessarily be approved by city council. This procedure requires study, discussion and executive sessions, patient attention at public hearings, and above all, leadership and vision on the part of our city council. Never in American history has the reputation of a big city changed so favorably as has Philadelphia's in the past few years. We are and should be proud of the new public image of our city. We should cherish this new image and seek continuously to live up to its high standards by all of the means within our power. The mature resolution of the Center City Plan is not the work of one man. It is the cumulative effect of the individual efforts of a great many people over an extended period of time, each one building on the work of the ones before. In definition and form, it begins to emerge as a total image, encompassing all of the projects developed thus far and outlining the projects which lie ahead. Now let the members of the City Planning Commission staff who worked on the plan present it for you. The Crosstown Expressway forms one side of the inner expressway loop, precisely defining the southern boundary of the original Penn Plan. Its depressed roadways have ramps directly connecting with the underground street system, serving a 6,000 car parking garage, a great terminal point for automobiles which do not contribute to the confusion of the surface streets. We treat the automobile as an honored guest and cater to its needs. The Delaware Expressway has been designed under the guidance of Street Commissioner David M. Smallwood in relation to the architectural requirements of the historic area. Above Society Hill, it connects with the Benjamin Franklin Bridge and continues to the north. The Schuylkill Expressway extends north along the west bank of the Schuylkill River, past 30th Street Station, connecting with the Vine Street Extension and proceeds north. The project which completes the parkway, the Park Town Place Redevelopment Project, clears up a blighted section and marks the beginning of a park extension being developed along the east bank of the Schuylkill River toward a terminus at the Crosstown Expressway. Chestnut Street will become a gracious, comfortable pedestrian street, reclaimed for the pedestrian by the removal of automobile traffic and the installation of light electric trolleys moving directly into the parking garages connecting with the expressway system. It will be landscaped to provide an attractive shopping mall in a very pleasant visual setting. The Pennsylvania Railroad commuter system converges at 30th Street Station and continues to the present underground terminal at Penn Center. The rail system is to be extended underground to a new lower level commuter station in East Market Street. From here, the tracks curve north to join the Reading Railroad, fusing the two commuter systems into one. 
the expressway systems move in toward the completion of the inner loop with special ramps moving directly to the north side of the longitudinal core, serving a 3,000 car parking garage and a bus loop one level above the street. Beneath Market Street, the subway stations open into a lower level garden connected by a shop line concourse with a commuter rail station to the north, a proper entrance to center city. At the street level, the shops are set back under building arcades with landscaped esplanades before them. On the upper level is the shopping promenade, extending in an uninterrupted three quarters of a mile above the street. Glass bridges leading into the second floors of the five department stores link their seven million square feet of retail space into a single functioning unit, served by every major means of transportation. This comparatively small but intense project binds together all parts of the plan into a cohesive whole. It is the three-dimensional system of space organization, a resolution of regional forces. This is not planning in the conventional sense, nor is it architecture. It is the form that should precede architecture, awaiting the designer's touch to bring it into life. The challenge to the architectural profession today is to prove that it is capable of designing an urban environment worth the price it costs. In order to do this, its individual practitioners will have to take a new view of their separate efforts, and the profession as a whole must take a new view of itself. We must train men who can think in terms of broad design structure, and who can deal with design problems at the level of government. Without a central design idea as an organizing force, the individual efforts under urban renewal will lead to chaos. With a central design idea, the creative energies of individual architects will be stimulated to new heights, and the result will be truly architecture.